Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Hey everybody, this is Bill Manning. This is Studio C41. I am here with Steven. Hey Bill, how's it going? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing? I'm uh, I'm doing well. Did you uh, have a good time with the uh, the eclipse? Did you go anywhere? Uh, my back porch, actually. Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, uh, I didn't get to see totality, which um, last week was kind of a crazy week for me. So it was nice to just be at home. And I had the glasses sat outside, you know. Yeah. It got pretty weird and dusky out. You could hear like all the cicadas start like going yeah. and chirping and everything. So it was, uh, it was cool. Oh, nice. But man. I didn't get to uh, be out where you were. Yes, I went up to uh, Cleveland, and uh, I'd been actually waiting for this for two years. I have my telescope. Uh, I had a, uh, an, a mount to uh, get my Nikon mounted into the telescope. I had a solar filter on it, and uh, I was shooting at equivalent uh, 600 millimeters at an F5. Nice. Um, so it was it was serious business when I was getting out there, and I had the the uh, equatorial mount set up yeah so yeah. it was tracking the sun throughout the entire day and uh and so it was kind of cool at the same time because there were kids out there um they were saying like oh man this is my first time seeing this and you know and i was like you know it's kind of weird because i'm 32 years old and i'm experiencing this for the first time myself so it was really cool to you know, see, have the kids look through the telescope and actually learn, you know, because they were you know, not in school that day and everything. But, you know, they were like, oh, what is that? I was like, those are sunspots. And they're like, oh, my gosh. So they were like totally blown away. So I was really happy that, you know, I was able to show the kids and then kind of feel like I was a kid again because I was experiencing something with them. So um, it, it was overall really awesome. Um, I got a shot of the uh, of totality. Uh, just, I was totally happy with that picture. So, uh, nice, man. I can't yeah. wait to see it. Unfortunately, I was, I only had one minute and the plan was I want, I really wanted to shoot some film to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was just one minute and then my camera started, I started shooting like crazy. I had a remote shutter for it and I'm shooting like crazy and, uh, the camera started buffering. I was oh. like, no, 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 no. Come on, come on, come on. And, and then a minute was over. <laughs> it was so fast. Uh, I was totally blown away. So I, I, I was, um, I, I wish I had more time. Uh, unlike, uh, some other folks up in, uh, Tennessee and everything where they had, uh, two and a half minutes, you know? So yeah, my, uh, my father-in-law actually is big into, uh, really into astronomy. He shipped his telescope to a sheep ranch in Idaho. Oh man. Where, uh, he basically spent, like they went out there, he'd been planning this for years, you know? And, uh, yeah. He does has an imaging camera for his telescope specifically and was shooting stills along with it. So I'm sure he got some ridiculous stuff. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so unfortunately, I cannot introduce Michael or Kevin because they're both bums. And you know what? Uh, since they're not here, I'm I'm just not going to defend them. No, actually, uh, Michael, as you guys know, he runs the business here. He runs Dunwoody Photo, and uh, so tonight's a busy night. I think he's still technically in the building. He was just he like is. up to his elbows in Fixer in a black and white processor a few yes. minutes ago. And then uh, Kevin also teaches um, down in Southern Crescent Technical. I'm right? still not sure that's a real place. <laughs> He's going to be so mad when he uh, he's like, this is a real place. I swear I am a professor. But no, he he does teach uh, filmmaking, lighting and electrical um, and film as well. So, yeah, he, um, he, he tries to get his uh, students like set up to at least do some film photography every semester. Yeah. So it, it's the start of the semester right now. And uh, he's super, super busy. But uh, uh, he says that he is here in spirit. Um, but he, he definitely will be, uh, in for the next, uh, few episodes while we have K E H here. So, uh, guys, you may not know who K E H K E H is, uh, just getting, uh, every film photographer out there pretty much knows who they are. Uh, but I have Brent and Mark here and, uh, we're just going to kind of introduce them and, uh, tell you have them tell you about KEH and uh, what they do. And uh, we got something really cool to talk about. Uh, we got some gear 
here at this table and I'm looking at some amazing gear. I can't wait to talk to you guys about it. I keep trying to like just stealthily take it off the table and walk out of the room. <laughs> but So uh, Brent, welcome on to the show, man. Uh, we, we've been talking about this, you know, for a couple months and, you know, getting this into the works and everything. And, you know, I, I'm, I've been looking forward to this. That's fantastic. Non-stop. I'm glad to be here. Yes. So thanks for uh, you as well, Mark, for coming on here. Um, you know, this the goal of this was to bring in local businesses and pretty much unite the the film photography community. Uh, so we had the photographer studio with John Mason um, a couple episodes back, and um, it was really cool to have him in there. I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. I want to get all the local businesses and organizations, uh, all the photography guilds, and just talk um, photography. I mean, it's, it's a very passionate thing and I I think that's really important. So, uh, uh, Brent, I'll let you take it away, man. Uh, so, uh, just give us the big spiel. Who are you, man? Sure. I'm, um, I'm a, the B2B manager, which basically B2B is our business to business where we work with a lot of camera dealers around the, uh, around the country. Uh, we've gone into Canada now, so we're working with a lot of Canada, uh, camera dealers. So that's been a lot of fun. But we basically go out and source equipment. So we'll work with a camera, a store, say, let's say in, in Houston, Texas, and we'll have a big buying event. We'll advertise that KEH is going to be there. And then we have people line up and sell us their gear. So we are basically what they call road buyers. So we travel around um, all over the place buying equipment. So it's uh, pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, I, it's funny because whenever you guys do like a buying event, and I actually got some gear that I, I've been waiting to, to take over to you guys. And, uh, it's like, we have new events. I'm going through the list. I'm like, oh, you guys are here in Georgia. Where is it? How come this this leg is not in Georgia? I was disappointed. But you guys have an in-house one coming up. We'll, we'll talk about that one later down the road. But uh, so I don't know. There's there's a camera on this table here that I'm really, really eyeing here. So um, make something I, happen. Yeah. I don't know. We're going to have to have a yeah, fist fight. I saw it first, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, um it's a bit of a trivia question. Uh, what does KEH stand for? It's the original owner's children. It's their first initial, King, Eleanor, and Hugh. So that basically is what makes up KEH Camera. And, and it, I found this in a blog. Uh, it, I, I don't know why. It was like three in the morning. And I was like, what the hell does KEH stand for? I don't even know, but I've done bought so many lenses from you guys and I've never really gave it a second thought as far as what it was. And I dug into the blogs and the archives of your blog and I found it and, uh, I, I, the power of the internet, man. So it's crazy stuff. It's nice that it, it, it's confirmed. So you heard it from Brent. I said this before we started recording, but I'm still just so glad that they're like these kind of, I say it. Not ambiguous, but kind of uh, not your average names. Like there's a, there's still some uh, there's still some mystery behind this. <laughs> that it's not just like you know Kevin Eric Henry. Right. <laughs> King is just not a common name these days. No, actually, I do have a fr- friend whose son is named King. It's kind of like a family name, but still, King Eleanor Hugh. Correct. That so is correct. That's uh, that sounds like something out of a Wes Anderson movie. I can get behind that. <laughs> you know, I. Uh, Totally off topic, nothing to do with photography, but I've been trying to convince my wife to have the name when we have kids that one of our kids would be named Leonidas. And she's like, why do you want to name Leonidas? And I was like, because legit, my grandfather's name was Leonidas. No way. Yes. Uh, And and so my mom's side of the family is Hispanic and everything. So uh, her father's name was Leonidas. And so uh, I was like, oh, my gosh. It's Greek, I, it, right? Yeah, it's Greek, but I mean, it, it, it's I mean, it's all its like, way. you know, yeah. Latin origins, you know, yeah. as far as language and everything. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. I totally want to have, like, if I have a son, I don't care what she says. I'm going to write it on the paper on the birth certificate first. It's going to be first name Leonidas. So that's she's going to be mad. Anyway, so this has nothing to do with photography. So I apologize, you guys. Uh, so um, we're going to get back into it here. So uh, Brent. What is some of the craziest gear that you have seen come through KEH? Because you're buying stuff, you got to see some crazy stuff. It's you know you get to a point where you kind of get numbed as as much as I hate saying that. Really, but there's so much cool stuff out there, and for me, it's it's really about like the Kodak Brownie. I I, I just love that stuff. But 
we come across interesting things. Um, we had a Japanese, it was a Japanese machine gun camera. They used it for doing aerial surveillance or reconnaissance oh, cool. during World War, um, I think it was World War One. So it was really kind of neat. Um, you don't see many of them. Most of the planes didn't survive. So that was, that was a cool one. Um, by far the neatest to me, you know, the important part of it is the story behind the camera. So I met a, a lady at a buying event. I think it might've been um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she had this Kodak camera, which Kodak cameras, most of them aren't really worth a lot, but just because there's so many produced. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, she, she was like, okay, I need to make sure that you find some place to a special home for this because this is belonged to my dad. This was given to him by Eastman Kodak on a boat wow. on the Pacific coast when they were hunting Kodiak bears. No Whoa. way. And I was, I kind of looked at her. I was like, I don't want to call you a liar, but how do you know that? She goes, Oh, look, it's even engraved. that it says it's made out to him. Wow. So it was, that was by far the coolest thing I've seen. What? I can't believe she would sell that. Well, she ended up, we couldn't really give her anything for it because the camera as a whole wasn't worth a lot, but we actually, um, we, we found it a really good home. So nice. somebody, somebody's going to get a lot of, a lot of use out of that. That's cool. Do you think, uh, do you ever, on that topic, do you ever like work with places like the uh, the George Eastman house or anything? If you find something like rare that they would possibly want as a display piece? Or? We, we, we do actually, um, the, the guy that's in charge of our eBay department actually donated a camera and I, I, I know it's terrible. I can't remember the guy's name, but it was a very famous picture from, um, the Vietnam protest. And it was a picture of a girl putting a daisy in a oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. barrel. That's iconic image. So we actually exactly. had one of this guy's cameras and, and donated it. Wow. Nice. So that was really That's cool. That's awesome. That's very cool. You know, it's, it's going back to um, the machine gun camera, I, I've always kind of wondered, and sorry if anybody over at Nikon hears this, but I'm, I was always curious as far as what Nikon's role was during like World War One and World War Two. You know, you... you don't really think about it, but they were there around that they time. They were definitely I mean, there. They had a hundred years. Well, they, I mean, same thing like Leica in World War II. Oh, I mean, yeah. certainly. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. The, some of their lenses actually say made in occupied Japan. Uh, I, but yes, you're not, right. Not I many do of remember them. something mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Wow. We, or I think we're going to have to do a little bit of a history research and uh, do an episode on that because uh, that would be really fun. Especially with Leica. I'm a giant history nerd, so that would be fine. Yeah. I'd be all about that. Sweet. We could see if we can give Dan Carlin a run for his money, the Hardcore History Podcast, where the guy <laughs> does like four hours at a time on World War II, One. You know. Oh, geez. Oh, my God. Uh, I yeah. I think people would definitely want to listen to us ramble about that. Yeah. yeah. I, I love history, too. But, I mean, you know, when you go four hours, I, I think it's, that would be complete overload It's for an me. amazing podcast. But, yeah, for Is sure. It really? It's really good. But by the time you're like... You just went through not even one year of the war yet. Oh, my gosh. It's so crazy. Death. So if anybody wants to waste, not waste, but use, <laughs> spend a lot of time to learn a lot about uh, history, that's a great one. It's not a hard one to keep up with, especially with the commute we have here that's in Atlanta. true. Yeah, for sure. Oh, geez. So, um, Brian, what is some of your favorite gear? What, what's Do you still shoot do you, with all the traveling you do and everything when you go and purchasing? Do you still pack a camera with you and all that? I do, yeah. I, I really kind of pared it down to a Fuji X10. It's just a nice point-and-shoot little nice. camera, basic zoom, good fast aperture on it, so it's really nice to use in all kinds of circumstances. But that's all I use. I set it on black and white and just go from there. That's nice. awesome. And then this weekend, we went up to Helen for the Eclipse and loaded up the Stylus Epic and the um, Olympus Stylus and my wife and I took a bunch of pictures. Oh man, that's awesome! That's nice. Fuji has been killing it in the in the mirrorless side of it. I mean, they they're untouchable. I mean, Sony. Everybody's been giving Sony a lot of uh, credit, um, but Fuji was really the first one that kind of pioneered you know mirrorless and actually has mastered it. I mean, I've never seen so many people go nuts over the GF, GFX fifty, right? Um, and then that they were able to bring down a price point that's better than i mean everybody was freaking about freaking out about uh, the Hasselblad X1D you know the price point that it was at i mean a Hasselblad medium format digital at $13,000 with the lens was like un, unheard of i mean for for most regular photographers it's just like $13,000 but when you got like a guy that's actually using it for a business and everything and you know, finances it out and everything like that. It's it's like a car payment, you know? So, I mean, that's an operational cost. So for 
to have it at that kind of price point is pretty amazing. And then Fujifilm comes in and knocks another five thousand dollars under that. Oh, I mean, no, I was like, great. holy cow! And then I didn't even think that a market for medium format digital at that price point even existed, you know. And I think somebody on Fujifilm rumors posted something saying, "Hey, I'm trying to figure out the the market share right now. Like, if." are you on the market for a GFX 50 and, or do you already have one? And, uh, I, I thought that there was going to be a, a larger number of people saying, Oh, I really want one. No, it was surprisingly, I want to say it was like almost double triple as far as the number of people that actually already own one. Now, granted, it's not a scientific poll or anything like that, but to, you know, see people that are actually commenting saying I own a medium format digital camera, it's going to be really interesting to see in the next five years as far as what's going to happen. I mean, you know, Nikon is late to the game, but they said they got something up their sleeve for mirrorless. So I can't wait to see what they got. They better hurry up and, and get it out there because nothing worse than waiting this long. I know. So hopefully that they'll stick with the AFS. Right. Uh, F mounts. Cause I, I think that well, would really hurt them. The if F they mount is everything to Nikon. It I is. Mean, so it would be just insane if they didn't. Yeah, it, it would be very disappointing to see them uh, um, go with a completely new mount and then just really split it up. But, I, you know, I have a feeling Nikon is going to do that. I mean, they tried with the Nikon. Oh, we're getting totally off topic, but they yeah, tried with the yeah. Nikon 1 Series cameras, and I don't even know if they're still making ones at all. No, they discontinued. I don't think so. Yeah, they, they completely they announced the discontinuation of it, and... Um, uh, and that that was right at the same time when they said that the management was going to be uh, rebuilding. So they just completely axed it. So, huh. and then you had their announcement of the D850, which was kind of interesting at the same time because a lot of people are like, "Oh man, I hope the before we knew what the D850 was going to be, they're like, oh, I hope it's going to be mirrorless. It's going to be mirrorless.'" And I was like, "I don't think it's going to be mirrorless because." They, they weren't, so you had the old people that were going in uh, before they got rotated out that had this already in design. It was already being made. And then when you had new management that came in, I think it would have been way too drastic and counter uh, intuitive to actually say, no, we're going to scrap this and put it out a mirrorless. I think that they're going to put out a mirrorless, I'm going to say within two years, realistically. Um, I would be surprised to see if they actually put out one that's, you know, a year from now. I, I, I just have a hard time seeing that because, you know, you had the D5 and then everything trickles down from the D5. You had the D850 and then uh, then you'll see the next lines where, you know, I don't know, maybe the D760 and then the, the D660 or whatever. So that's going to be, you know, next year. And then you're going to start seeing, you know, the the prosumer and the consumer level where they're going to have a lot of that sensor technology that's going to trickle out before you start seeing, you know, a new professional body out there because they're, they're just way too invested in it right now that, you know, it, I've had my D610 since 2014, you know, and that's been three years. So I, I think it's going to be a little bit of time before we start even seeing anything from, is it bad that I just don't care anymore? Like, I really don't. I, uh, well, especially like, so Michael and I and Brent all used to work at Wolf Camera back in the day. Brent was a district manager when I started. Um, and, uh, there was so much of like the, the, the constant chasing of gear, of yeah. like always the newest, latest, greatest. And then when I left Wolf, all of a sudden it was, I don't have to keep up with this anymore. And it's really nice. And uh, I was going to ask just to kind of interject and made me think of it with uh, talking about all the new models and whatever happens next. How much is that actually a factor for you guys when it comes to, you know, being so known as the used camera equipment, the used camera buyer? Like, what does it matter? I know because you guys do sell new equipment still too. Uh, how much of an issue is it like worrying about, oh, there's going to be a D870 next month or, you know. That to us, it's it's really, we look forward to the changes of models because okay. it's like anything. You have people sitting out there waiting for the next model to come out so they can buy it when it's used, like like buying cars for yeah, the most yeah. part. So people jump in and can save some money, and that's that's where we really kind of fill that gap. And it, we love it because it allows us to get our hands on all the equipment people are trading up for. Okay, cool. 
And it gives us a, a, the reality is we sell all kinds of cameras. Yeah, for sure. The whole range. We don't have to be this or that. We're sort of the camera store and ca camera company for everybody, right. no matter what type of photography you're doing. That's very cool because I don't think a lot of people, because like Bill was saying, like especially if you're in the analog community or you know, you looking to pick up older film gear and stuff, people think of KEH right away, but I don't think a lot of people think of you guys just right off the bat as somewhere to get something new. Right. Well, we don't have a huge, we don't carry a lot of uh, new equipment. Uh, we, we carry a little bit of it. Uh, it's, it's not something that we really kind of gotten into because it's a very difficult thing to determine, you know, how many items are we going to need? Plus, you know, if we're not going to be the first place that you go to, you kind of get to the point, well, we've, we've really made our name of carrying everything else. So that's what we're, we're we really look for and excel in. And and we're really in a sense recycling. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I true. mean the stuff is all these cameras we have sitting here are perfectly fine and can be used professionally and people use them, but whatever model, whether it's analog or digital, we have the ability and, and there are a lot of people that are interested in the fact that they don't want to go and buy something new. They want to find something that's good that's 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 used. For sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny, uh, Stephen, you posted something on uh, Facebook uh, in the Atlanta Film Photographers Group. I was saying if there was a new film camera to come out into the market, what would be the one, like, what would it, what was it again? It was to like, if, uh, what would you want to see in like a new film camera brought That's to right. market? Yeah. And I think Bill's first post, he was the first person to respond and said a warranty. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but yeah, yeah, then realize, I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but, KEH has a six month warranty. Yes. So true. you're buying a used camera that's been totally gone over and you have a, a, a two week return policy and you have a six month warranty on a used camera. Yeah. And I mean, I, I've purchased from you guys several times and your, your grading on it is very strict because I, I remember getting something that was, I think it was just uh, just rated as excellent. And because you have, what, what's the rating system you have? The, the bargain and then... Correct, yeah. It, it goes basically goes bargain, excellent, excellent plus, like new minus. Okay, that's what we it was. get very little like new minus um, just because it's, we have such high standards. Yeah, I, I bought a 24 to 70 from you guys. Got it. Uh, the Nikon 24 to 7 2.8. And uh, it was excellent. And I was like, ah, well, I guess, I mean, it's got the warranty on it. So, I, you know, what do I have to lose? And I got it and I was like, there is nothing wrong with this thing. <laughs> this thing's brand new. Oh my god! Well, that's like know? this one of yeah. the cameras we have here is is bargain condition, and I, you know, that's probably what most other people would mark as like excellent or very right. good. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm looking at some of the stuff. I'm like, I, the plastic looks still looks shiny. Yeah. On it, you know. But so, uh, I think we uh we've neglected one other person at the table here. We but. have. I mean, we're we're starting to get into the gear and everything, but we also have Mark. Hi, Mark. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Mark. We, we, we just, you know, you know how it is. We, we get sucked into the black hole of this gear. I mean, I'm just looking at everything here, man. And you, you got a camera over there right by you that is absolutely beautiful. So no, that's your camera, right? Too, right? Uh, no, no, it's no, not. No, no, okay. All right. So, but all right. So Mark, uh, what do you do at KH, man? Okay, uh, so my name is Mark Mayo and I've been with the company really just a very short time about a month and a half, although I've been a customer of KEH camera since 1980. So wow. it's, right. you know, KEH camera started in 1979. I moved here in 80, Yeah, was a customer. And I feel that over all those years, as you mentioned, in terms of grading customer service, mm -hmm. taking care of the, taking care of the customer, I both the, the, equipment I bought and, and sending my friends and colleagues. I mean, no one has ever come back to me and said, gee, I went to KH and got, you know, had a bad experience. Right. So about a year ago, I started a conversation with the, the CEO of KH and we talked about here we have this camera company, a used camera company. You have people like Brent, a lot of people in the company that have this extreme knowledge of photography and cameras and we looked at the management and said well there's all these people in management that know what they're 
roles are and what they're doing in the company, but not really knowing a lot about photography. So the CEO uh, went to the owner and they talked about and created the position for me called uh, I'm the KEH ambassador. And so I've got this extensive photography background. I also mm-hmm. have extensive business background. And so I'm there to represent, in, in essence, our customers, both individual customers, photographic organizations, mm-hmm. uh, nonprofit organizations, to sort of bring the viewpoint of the customer into the company and and represent, because Cage is, I mean, that's who we have to go after. That's what, I mean, right. we have to take care of the photographic community. So we need to be engaged in it. So I'll be giving, I'll be giving lectures. I teach workshops. I, my work's represented in a gallery, a Lumiere gallery here in town. So we've, we've reached out and we're going to be doing things with Atlanta celebrates photography, Atlanta photography group. Uh, we're, we've got plans to work with, uh, PPV, um, society for photographic education. So we're really trying to take the company and partner with the photographic community to be in in essence mutually beneficial and add to the the community in addition to selling quality used equipment and buying equipment yeah that's that's fantastic yeah yeah that i mean that's absolutely awesome you know and it's been so tough on on the retail business like you know unfortunately showcases you know succumb to to the internet and you know the bigger powers up in new york um, I shall not speak their names. Um, but you know, there was a article that came up on Betapixel about showcase and it was really sad, you know, and I think what you said there, uh, to, to bring a sense of community around Atlanta is so important because, uh, e- even on the internet, um, you know, people that are on the other side of the world are still referencing KEH. And I mean, that is just absolutely amazing to, to be on a forum and then somebody reference something that's literally like right down the road for me. It's so cool. And I think it's yeah. rare too, that you mentioning showcase when you think of it, cause I had a, I had a good friend who was a salesperson there when mm-hmm. they closed and yeah. it was kind of the case of a lot of places like showcase, a lot of these and Brent, you might be able to speak to this, just seeing these independent camera stores, and anything kind of in this changing industry that, and especially for you guys even too, it takes something special to like want to stick it out and like stick out the changes and stick out. Um, I mean, it, it takes a little bit of fight in you, a lot of fight in you even. And that was the guys at Showcase. They just, they were, they would probably have been still good to go for a few years, keep doing what they were doing, but they just took it as an opportunity to retire and like to just kind of like not have to be making that effort or that fight anymore to like keep changing and adapting. Yeah, it's, it's tough because I, as we do these shows around the com- or around the country, you, you see all these smaller stores that are just really struggling. And it, it's, it's disheartening because you, you know that they're in their area of the world, people gather there and that's where they go and learn and, and share ideas. And we're, we're kind of losing some of that. So that's, well, it, it is a little disappointing. And, and that really happened in Atlanta. I mean, when mm-hmm. you had, you had showcase, you had the main wolf, you had uh, Photo Barn, yep. uh, and and we all had different places. Or you'd go there, and when you'd go to the camera store, it wouldn't just be to buy what you're going to buy. You knew you're going to meet colleagues, and it was a meeting place for sure. And yeah. that's that's gone now. And I and I mean, KH wants to to reinvigorate that idea of community and serving the community. But I mean, on, on the other hand, and I would say this to my friends when they were going and buying equipment, you know, and somebody say, well, I can get it on the internet over here for 50 bucks less. Well, you know, I mean, is it just always about price or is it about the support that you get from the, from the company that you're buying it from? Absolutely. And, and, and I think, you know, we lose that in the, in the Amazon era of I can get everything really cheap, but do you have somebody there to stand by you, to help you, to show you, to teach you, and support the organizations that you're that you belong to. Well, I'm sure Stephen can speak to this because I know you you've helped customers for an hour, hour and a half, and then they come in two days later with a brand new camera. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, um, oh man, that's brutal. It was. I don't know. It was always one of those things that. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm trying to think of that experience because there were people who. It was such a mixed bag. There were people who would do that, but then I had 
uh, some customers like follow me from like when I was going from different wolf camera to wolf Sorry. camera, like follow me to different stores because I had built a relationship and like that goodwill. And that was the time that you put in that was worth it. And, um, well, I think, you know, for KH, for the time I was a customer since 1980, that, that there's a trust. Oh yeah. And, and Absolutely. there's, a, and you know, now, I mean, that's, that's why it's so easy for me to work for them because they, they represent what I believe is important mm -hmm. in the company that they're going to take, yeah, you know, they're going to take care of the customer. Will somebody make a mistake? Of course, but but the the fact is that the people there are dedicated to doing the best they can and taking care of the customer the best they can, and and providing a fair and honest experience in in buying or selling. It, it's absolutely true, and and, and again, it, and I'll, I'll backtrack. We did not. KEH is not paying us. We're not paying KEH. This is, I mean, this is truly an organic gathering here. Just literally talking about one of the biggest forces here in Atlanta when it comes to photographic equipment and community and organizations. But to, to touch on what Mark just said is absolutely true. My coworker, uh, she's also a photographer and she had been eyeing, I can't remember which one, but it, it was a, uh, it was a pretty decent piece of glass from Canon and um, she came to me and she says, I, I just don't feel like that the focus is right on it and everything. And, you know, I tested it out and I was like, I don't know, this focus seems OK to me. You know, she's like, I just I'm not I'm not happy with it. I was like, well, just give KEH a call. I'm sure they're going to take good care of you. And, and and literally she made that call and then KEH was like, just pack it up and send it right back to us. We'll send you another one. We have one in stock. And and she got the other one and she just seemed happier after that one. And she was like, wow, that was absolutely easy. And I mean, it, it's absolutely true because, you know, you can trade gear on the Facebook groups and all that stuff. And you can get, you know, something that somebody didn't take good care of, you know, and then you're stuck with it, you know, and you can try to get it sent back, but you know, that's, it's pretty much done. You can't do that with a KEH. I mean, if they still have it in stock that, I mean, you, you guys really do take care of us. I mean, it, it's, it's the God honest truth. Well, I mean, and you said something to me, you know, a force in Atlanta, but the reality is we're a force in oh, the yeah, world. Absolutely. I mean, we're the yes. largest in the, you know, buyer and seller of used camera equipment right. in the world. So, you know, that, that those tentacles stretch uh, across the ocean, uh, taking care of people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my, my mind, my world is not beyond <laughs> Cherokee <laughs> County. <laughs> so, but no, that, I mean, it's absolutely true, uh, completely around the world. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to dive into some gear. Yes. Um, all right. So you guys, why don't you guys go ahead and just quickly list out what you what you got here on the table here because I'm like already salivating here. I can't talk. I'm going to drool over all the equipment. <laughs> all right. So the first one we have is the Mamiya 7. It's just always been kind of a favorite of mine. Amazing camera. I think Stephen mentioned that he had a chance to use it. Mark said he he's actually used it before. Um, just incredible. So it's real simple to use. But just amazing picture quality. It has a leaf shutter lens. And then we have a Mamiya RB67, which is, to me, the kind of the, the standby. It's, um, you, can't, you can't go wrong with it. It's, it's a workhorse camera. And it used to be, I mean, the camera for commercial port portrait photographers. I mean, that's, that's what they had. Yeah, the, the RB, and then there's the big brother, the RZ, the that, uh, right. that is still, from what, uh, from what I've read, is still in... Not not so much production, but it's it's still being used uh, because it has the capability in the RZ Pro Two to be connected into digital backs, so you can still have the benefit of film and still have you know really cool quality images when if you ever can upgrade to a digital back, and uh, it's sitting on the front of my mind because I'm 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 eyeing the Mamiya Seven and. Somebody said, well, check out the RZ because I do have a phase one back. And I was like, ooh, I could get an RZ. It's a big camera, though, you know, but the the images that come out of it, is the, even the RB and the RZ are just absolutely amazing. So now can on the RB, can, do the lenses on the RB fit on the RZ as well or yes or no? Yeah. So I actually have an RB67 and I love it. And it is totally a tank. I mean, with the uh, the Prism viewfinder, which that thing itself probably weighs three pounds. Um, and it is, 
it's one of my favorite cameras ever to shoot and I don't get to shoot it often just because it, I basically just keep it on a tripod because it is such a beast to lug around. But the images, like you said, are phenomenal. Um, and that I think if I was had that as my only camera for the rest of my life, I'd be happy still. Um, but yes, the so the way that it's set up, um, there's three iterations of the RB67. There's the original, there's the Pro S and the Pro SD. The most common, I think, is the Pro S probably. Right, That's that what correct. I have. That's what we have here. Um, although this one is a lot prettier than my Pro S. Mine's <laughs> been around the block a few times. Um, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I want to say that the last iteration of the lenses that were the KL version. That is correct, yes. Yeah, those are backwards compatible onto the RZ bodies. But the RZ lenses are not usable on the RB. Exactly. Uh, okay, good to know. So... Um, the RB is a leaf shutter um, and a focal plane, correct? Or is no, it just leaf shutter? It's just the leaf shutter. Okay. Right? Which the advantage is great for like, it's really truly a studio camera is what it's made for. And the beautiful thing about a leaf shutter is you can sync flash at any shutter speed. Right. So you can, the lenses on there usually only go up to a 400th of a second, which is super slow in comparison to a lot of cameras. Even like my Canon AE-1 goes to a thousandth of a second. Um, but it can only flash sync up to one one twenty fifth or no one sixtieth. One sixtieth on a few of those yeah, one thirty five. But yeah. this you can sync your flash all the way up to one four hundredth of a second, and it comes in handy. I'm uh, ever since I've switched over leaf shutter, um, like going over to like the the Mami or not the Mamiya the uh, Fuji EFX fifty. Like the only thing that's holding me back from going to it is. It doesn't have a leaf shutter, and once you shoot on a leaf shutter, it's it's completely different. You know, I I, I just can't do it. Yeah. So I'm I'm totally they're yeah. super quiet too. They are the funny thing about like the uh, so like the Mamiya Seven here is it's a it's a we haven't even talked about the other cameras yet, but it's kind of a it's a fantastic contrast. Yeah, the Mamiya Seven is light, it's quiet, it's a rangefinder. It doesn't have any mirror on it. So even though these are both shooting. 6.7 format, so medium format film. That's one of the larger formats. You can do 10 shots on a roll of 120, perfect proportions for 8x10. Um, but the uh, Mamiya 7 is super quiet. I don't know if we will trip the shutter right now because there's not any film there's, in it. But, yeah, there's not any uh, film in it right now. But it's very, like most rangefinders are very just like, like just super quiet and nice. But with the, uh, the RB67, the... Uh, Shutter itself, because it's a leaf shutter, also very, very quiet. But then it has this mirror inside of it, which is actually that sound right here. I don't know if you can actually hear it on the... Probably picked up. Yeah. So it's that that fantastic thunk of like the actual like <laughs> mirror flap on yeah. this thing. Nothing will beat the Pentax 6.7. Oh, no. That thing is responsible for some small earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the the comparison on that. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, the the RB is uh, is a serious serious camera. Now, would you guys say like who would fit this? Would this be good for a beginner or uh, you know somebody that's serious? I mean, I would, would, I would say, say that? probably want to get somebody that's a little bit more serious about it. It's really more of a studio camera. I'll, I'll never forget when I was at Wolf. I sold one of these to a guy that was going to shoot weddings with it. I just could not understand how that was going to happen. But oh, I, I, oh my God. I saw him I've tried later. to shoot weddings. <laughs> I've tried to shoot weddings with one of these oh. with the prism and I have the handle for it. And even so That's I could just more weight. Yeah. I could only maybe get away at one, one twenty fifth or one two fiftieth of a second was the slowest shutter speed I could oh. handhold. This oh thing my at. gosh. Yeah. Wow. Well, and the uh, lenses aren't that fast either. Like three eight is the fastest lens on this camera. And you okay. have to plan out your shots because without that, a lot of a lot of frames right. available, it can get very difficult. Especially without backs. 220 anymore. Right. You know, like that was, I have a 220 back for this and a few rolls still sitting in my fridge. I think though, you know, as even back in the film days, any of the two and a quarters, taking a roll of film and having to open it, a 120 roll of film, and feed it into a camera and make sure you had it on the right way and then make sure you advanced it correctly as opposed to 35 millimeter, which is almost you just drop it in, do a few shots, close the back. and So, I mean, you're talking about beginners. I think that's even, you know, 
more of a of of a problem to overcome in the beginning is just the handling of the film for sure and yeah. loading the cameras yeah medium format as a whole is a it's it there are some cameras like you know the Mamiya 7 the Pentax 6 7 we have here or don't have here excuse me um where it's more akin to a big SLR um but like you said, this even the handling the film, it's a whole that that's what really tripped me up when I first got into medium format. And it does slow you down a lot, um, even which is in, not a bad thing. No, it's not. But then that's also why a lot of these cameras that are the kind of more modular systems have multiple film inserts or film backs so that you can be on a shoot like I, I at a wedding. I have multiple inserts for my Pentax 645. Um, and even so, I still find myself having to stop and like reload and like take times for my second shooter to do something while I'm like having to re change out all the film on those. There's a lot well, of planning around it. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think especially somebody coming now from digital where you stick a SD card in and you've got 500 shots and you just take as many photographs as you want. And then you go to something like this with the Mia 7 where you've only got 10 images. Right. And so it's. You're buying the film, which, I mean, goes back to all of us that did start it with film. I mean, how much money you got when you roll the film you're going <laughs> to carry? And then, you know, how many shots do you actually have? And then how much you're going to have to spend to get it processed yeah. and printed? So, I mean, you, 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 for, it, it was a way to force yourself to think more about the images you were making rather than just blasting off for sure yeah. a bunch of, a bunch of shots because you can just all just delete them in the end. Yeah, it, and it's kind of funny because I'm so used to shooting so little frames now that when I go to 35, I'm like 36 shots. I'm like, the last six or seven pictures are going to be like of my cat <laughs> before <laughs> I go to take a process because I'm like, I, I'm I've run out. I 36 seems like a lot now, and you know, and now you know, as Mark was saying earlier, you know, I have uh, 128 gig SD cards that I drop into my D610 and it says I have 2.3 thousand raw images, wow. you know, so it's kind of needed for weddings and stuff like that. So I'm not having to constantly change it out. And then I'm using the dual SD for backup and all that stuff, but you know, it's, and I'll fill it up. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm still heavy finger heavy when it comes to shooting weddings and stuff like that. But, um, that's even then it's like, 36 frames I, it seems too much for me and they even I'm so used to like my i have an afd2 and that has 15 and uh that seems like the a good amount for me where i'm like okay uh i can pop the back off throw another one on really quick and i i've been really happy with that that style format um just because i mean you, you can do what, what was it mark you were saying earlier before we were recording that you had different exposure settings for for different backs on the, sure yeah, uh, yeah. I, st I still have my Hasselblad 500 cm and it mm -hmm. has interchangeable backs for it so i did most of my work in black and white and i had three backs for it i'd have the same film in all three backs mm -hmm. but one of them i'd have marked for normal development when i get back one of them for minus development so the the brightness in the scene was so high that i had to cut back the development to keep detail in the highlights and then i'd have one that had plus development. So the contrast in the scene was low. So I'd go out and photograph you know, on a trip for a week and I'd have these three backs and I'd mark the film when I got done. So I'd switch it. So I'd switch out the backs because obviously you can only process a roll of film one way. Yeah. Yeah. And I was right. doing it by hand. So, but, but I, I think the other thing though, is it also, I mean, you know, we have the two sides here. You've got working as a commercial photographer, using film and doing weddings. And that's one thing. And right. having, but if you're if you're doing this and using it as an art form and making images that say something, the fact that it slows you down and forces you only have so many exposures. You know, we if you talk to any photographer that did all film photography and you'd go you know, go out to the Southwest and photograph for a week. I mean, you had your cooler full of film, you only had so many rolls and you <laughs> you sort of rationed it in term. And so it forced you to look at things differently and you just didn't make random photographs just to make them. You really thought more about it. And I think for me, at least it, it, it helped me become a better photographer. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the same way I think it translates to shooting weddings and portraits and everything too. Like 
Bill, you talked about being it's kind of heavy on the shutter count still. Yeah. Shooting film on weddings has, oh, geez, it's probably reduced it by like three quarters the amount of images that I shoot on a wedding day now, even like shooting film and digital together, just because, Marco, you were saying I'm taking my time and being more deliberate. And it's less exhausting for my subjects, too. Like, well, it is. I mean, I think the other thing that I find is that I never look now, now I, I have my digital Leica. Yeah. Which mo- I've, I've used mostly Leica in my career. I never look, I never look at the back of the camera and ever, you know, like, well, aren't you afraid? Or, you know, don't you see, want to see what you, you have? It's like, I spent 35 years of my life <laughs> using film and not knowing what it was until it was developed. I know when I've made an exposure, what it's going to be. I don't yeah. need to constantly be looking at the back of the, you know, the, the, the finder to, to, or the, the, the LCD screen to tell me what it is I have. I mean, if there was anything yeah. that helped me, it would be, give me a, give me a histogram of a yep. raw, mm-hmm. of a raw exposure. Just give me that histogram would be more valuable than seeing the actual image on the, you know, the back of the screen. There's a certain point where I've talked to a lot of, cause it has been much more and more commonplace to see people who've been shooting for a while, shooting, come up, shooting digital, um, in like our age range and younger, even who are now introducing film into what they're doing. And I have a number of friends who are, they're all kind of, it's starting to click. They're getting to that point where like you said, they're not having to look at their screen anymore. They're trusting what they're doing. And it's this like just beautiful thing. That's really, really cool. When you've shot enough film, when you have gotten the scans back and like, I, I don't have to see this. I can actually like trust myself that I'm going to get the images that I want. Well, you know, there's that, that saying of the 10,000 hours, you know, whether you're mm, yep. a scary, well, I mean, 10,000 exposures, right? But you know, 10,000 exposures because you've got a motor drive and you're holding the button down is, <laughs> is different than making really 10,000 exposures. And I mean, the more you do, the more you, you know, the better you see and the better Im- I find, I find myself now, now I'm 62 years old and I've been photographing since 1973. I, I make less exposures and, and I'm, I'm happier with a higher percentage of them. Now that's when I say happier, I could photograph all weekend and get maybe four or five or six images that I really, but I find myself now being able to react, see, react and make an image without having to make a bunch of other images. Yeah, for sure. 20 years ago, I could see myself in film. You'd see a contact sheet and I, you could, and I noticed this from printing. I'd keep notes of the, of the photographs that I but the images that I would print, right? And I always have the frame number on it. And and all of a sudden, I, I noticed that I was always printing frame uh, 15, 16, 17, you know, or 34, 35, 36. And I would look at the contact sheet and I'd see myself going through this process of photographing. And I'd do, you know, a half or almost a half a roll of film. I wasn't thinking of it. That's cool. Number 36 exposure, right? And I'd find in about, I get about, you know, frame number 16, 17, 18, I'd stop. And then I'd find myself on frame 19, starting another sequence of something. And I'd get to, to be about, because I knew when the end of the roll was coming, but I would find myself getting there, stopping. So in some ways, film was a great teacher. Oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, we sort of go through and we stick it in Lightroom and people are, you know, or, or they're actually looking on the back of their camera, deleting images before they even get them yeah. on, a, on a monitor or they get them in Lightroom and they're like, I like that one. I'm going to throw the other 18 out. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's a really good point. And I would love to, we still have more cameras we want to talk about here, but there's um, just that aspect of, of spending time with your images and seeing the sequence in your progression and where you actually do have that that linear chronological aspect of a roll of film, like you started here and you got to this point and well, seeing that progression. Well, I found, you know, I, I was working and doing my own photography full time. And I was working actually imaging and ophthalmology inside the eye, but I was doing my own fine artwork, my projects. So I didn't have the time to, to, to photograph. I'd come, I'd get back, I'd process the film, I'd make a contact sheet and that was it. I'd let it sit there. And then over the period of six to eight months, I'd look at my contact sheets 
And so I sort of came up with this. And it's, it's what I've what I call my blog, but it's it's a, a phrase I use. It's called critical distance. Hmm. It's the re- removing yourself from the act of making the photograph to be able to look at the image and judge it on the merits of does it work as a photograph? Not that I got up or if you went to the go to do the eclipse, well, I did this and I drove here and I had this equipment right. and I set this up and we got up five hours early and blah, blah, blah. doesn't make it a good photograph. Right. I mean, Absolutely. It, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. And so in some ways, this slowing down or removing yourself in a sense now, commercially, you got to do the stuff you got to do, but I'm sure, talking. Sure. I'm talking about personal fine artwork. Mm-hmm. Having that distance from the actual act of making it, because we are in the euphoria. I'm I'm in I'm in Grand Teton, and I'm photographing the Mormon barn, and we got up early in the morning. Right. Here's the sun, and it's beautiful, and the Tetons are back there. It doesn't make it a good photograph. Mm-hmm. It makes yeah. it a great experience. So I found that way, like with this place I keep going back to is Banff in the Canadian Rockies and heading back there in a few weeks again to shoot a wedding and inevitably we'll be doing a lot of landscape stuff too. And just what you were saying, I found myself more and more kind of some of the initial, I would say shock and awe of being in this incredible place has worn off just a little bit in the fact of like that I'm starting to look at it a little more critically and the images that I've made there just to be like, okay, well, these are really strong and why? Well, I mean, and it goes back to, I mean, I think it was Paul Strand or Stieglitz. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember. The, I'm but, just happy that but, you're but, like referencing like <laughs> F64 guys right now. So that's, that's fine. Go but, ahead. I mean, he, he photographed in his backyard for a whole year. And I mean, you get that view of photographing in your, uh, it, you know, we all, you know, there, there's, this, there's this tendency that we have to go someplace exotic to make good photographs and we're there for only five or seven days and we really don't understand and learn anything about where we're at and we're trying to make photographs that say something about it when the reality is the best photographs you can make are the places that you can go back to yeah, for over sure. a period of time and some of that's literally in your backyard that's what i've heard it said numerous times about ansel adams captured yosemite the way he did because he lived there because that was his backyard he right. knew it you got to know the place, and, and you experience. know the you know the light, and you mm-hmm. know what you want, and you you're there. I mean, part of it is having the you know, what's the best camera, the one you have with you, yeah. and being there to to make a, an image. Yeah. So, um, before you get back into the gear, I just want to say on and the, the aspect of looking at your images and stuff. Um, I know a lot of people now who have gotten into film and haven't had the tangible aspect of the darkroom at of like developing, seeing their own images, seeing an exposure that didn't work, and why who are just getting their film developed and scanned at a lab. And some people don't even get their negatives back or don't even look at them. They'll just throw them in a box. Don't even come back for them. Or don't even come back for them sometimes. If I can do anything to tell anybody, get your negatives. Like, because you're never going to fully understand your exposures and why they're not working until you actually see that one frame. Look, oh, this was underexposed massively. That's why it didn't come out. That's what happened with this. So... I can't say enough of that, of get your film back from your lab and actually look at the physical negatives. Well, you know, if you're you're taking your film to a lab that's not giving your negatives back, you're going to the wrong oh, lab. Oh, yeah, for sure. But there's some people who don't even, like, there are some pro labs who will store people's negatives for rescanning, and they just don't even ever bother to get them back from the lab to begin with. So, and that's a lot of people who are, have been the, the recent adopters of film who don't understand that aspect. Well, you know, I I think, I think part of what we're looking at also is that film has become the new alternative process. Oh, for sure. I'm going to, I'm going to define myself as a young photographer in this sense. And because I'm, you know, I'm going to use film now because other people are using digital. It, It was just when, you know, I'm old enough to when alternative music came out, well, alternative music became so popular. It was like, it was more popular than popular music, <laughs> but people liked alternative music because it was quote alternative. So, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's, it, but, but it's, but it's, it's a process. It's a, it's a physical sure. scientific process. And also people don't realize that so many of the tools that we're using in Photoshop and Lightroom are all based on physical things that we used to do with an enlarger mm-hmm. and in the dark room in terms yep. of dodging, burning, doing this and that understanding those tools and and in a physical sense i think helps you understand them in the digital sense oh, yeah. of using Absolutely. of using you know software like photoshop and lightroom it's pretty cool to see people's minds 
below when they make the connection where you see dodge and burn in Lightroom, and then they realize where it came from. Right. A game well, of the dark room. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I don't know how common this is, but I mean, Photoshop was never developed for photographers. It was developed for graphic artists and, and designers as we were making the switch from printing, um, on digital presses. Mm -hmm. And so we had to have digital files. And so the designers had to get images into those files and that, you know, and then as photographers, we started co-opting it and starting using it for making and working on photographs. It really wasn't until Lightroom came out. That's really totally a, a, a photography photographers, you know, based software program. Yeah. Oh, well you can even just tell from the workflow of Lightroom, but yeah. Um, so anyway, I know we have spent a lot of time and it's just been awesome to talk to you guys for starters, but we do have this gear that I, I know we want to yeah, get through. And we're going to, we're going to change gears up a little bit. So we've been talking about the six, seven format and, but, uh, what a lot of people really don't talk much about is the six by six format square formats. Um, you have a couple different kinds of, we talked about the Hasselblad earlier, uh, but, uh, there's another one called, uh, the TLR. And that's the uh, twin reflex lens. Uh, so, uh, Brent, why don't you uh, hop in and just kind of kind of explain to everybody what you know for those that don't know what a TLR is and what is it that's so different compared to you know some of these other traditional SLRs. Good deal. The the, the what we have here is the Raleigh Flex. It's the two point eight f. So it's a pretty common Raleigh Flex, but it's just a really nice, simple, easy to work with. Has a built in meter on it. Um, incredible results, but with the TLR, you're actually not looking through the lens. You're actually looking through a prism just above the lens. So it, that's, that's where it's the, really the biggest difference from most of the cameras we have here. The, the prism, uh, you know, coming from somebody that's always looked through a traditional SLR, you, you get really thrown backwards. Uh, it, it is it yeah. is very difficult to get used to. It really is. Well, we actually three of the cameras we have here today have these prism waist yep. level they or they don't have prisms. They have waist level finders. Right. The RB comes with one. The yep. Hasselblad, which uh, we should get into a little more of that too, and then this one as well. And uh, it is because you don't have that the light that's coming through. It's it's right side up, but it's backwards. It's that mirror yep. image, and you're looking down at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Which, right. Which I know for. The TLRs, that's a lot of the appeal of these cameras. Um, they're significantly smaller because they don't have to have a mirror. Um, and they're quieter in some cases. And they're just known for street photography. I mean, if anybody's seen the documentary Finding Vivian Meyer, I mean, she was walking around with one of these cameras. I don't know if it was the 2.8 Roloflex, but it was a Roloflex. Right, it's pretty inconspicuous. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's also an attention grabber, too, because it, it is. It, it's it's you don't see it all that often yeah it is interesting like you know when she was going around a camera like this was kind of commonplace but right now you know we're so used to people being on a phone taking photos something like this really stands out yeah that's a so my first camera uh into film was uh a yashica 635 and I, I talked about it in the episode back but that was actually gifted to me from somebody that had passed away they they left it in their will to give it to me and that was really my first introduction into it. And uh, it's a great way to start. It, it is. And I think TLRs are a great starter camera, um, at least for me, because, I mean, it was simple. I, you know, a quick YouTube video and I knew how to load the film in. Um, there, there wasn't really any complications with it. You know, it gets a little tricky every once in a while for the first couple times, you know, loading the film up into a back on, like, say, the Hasselblads or the, the RBs. Um, uh, but the TLR, they're just they're timeless. I mean, they're, they're just beautiful cameras. They really are. So so uh, let's throw in TLR stands for twin lens reflex. Yep. And I mean, another line of cameras like another twin lens is the Mamiya's. I mean, my first yep, tw right. my first two and a quarter was a Mamiya C330. Um, another great TLR. Yeah. Thing. And then they had a 220. Although you, you, you did say something interesting, and that is when you got it, you went on and looked at YouTube video to learn how to use it, yeah. which is completely different. Yeah. I mean, when you think about <laughs> yeah, it, it's true. when we were learning how to do it, there was no YouTube and right. there was no going on to, and just looking And It's great that, that, that you can do that now. Cause I'm sure with any of these cameras, oh, you, yeah. could, you could go and find some, somebody's already gone through and done. And, and so you, 
yeah, it, that learning curve is, is, is much shorter. It really is. When I, I mean, I even got my, I got my RB 67 in 2007. And even then it was so hard to find information on these. I found somebody who had scanned in and made a PDF of the instruction manual. And I was just kind of like that and had a, a really patient, a photo professor who spent some time with me on it and ruined my fair share of roles through it too, just trying to figure <laughs> out how the camera works. Well, and, and this is, it bring, to me brings up an, a, another point that, that, I, that I've noticed is that with film in, 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 back in the day, and that was really up until about 2005, if you were going to be a serious photographer, there was a lot you had to learn. And there was a lot you had to learn how to do. And a lot of it was printing your own stuff and processing your own film and making your own prints. And then digital came. And that, you know, the ticket into the game changed. Right. You didn't need to have all this knowledge anymore. You didn't have to need, you didn't have to have all that skill of on the, on the darkroom side and on the film side. So it's interesting to see how that is in some ways changed photography and it's interesting now to see people moving back towards the film mm -hmm. to pick up that that same uh looking at a different way of of of, of making photographs for sure and, it's, and this roly flex even smells like awesomely old like yeah. it was in the antique <laughs> shop it smells so, so awesome uh, so clean too like the viewfinder the glass everything um i didn't realize that they well because do you guys happen to know, because it's using a selenium meter, it's called, so it doesn't right. use any kind of power. It's using a chemical to actually... Correct. Selenium, the mineral, to measure the light. They lose their charge after some time. Do you know if Roly will still like service these and recharge these meters, or...? I don't think that they will, but there are third parties out there that will, will take care of that. Okay, for you. cool, because I know Sekonic, like if you have their selenium meters, Certainly. even their old ones, they'll recharge those for right. you. So that's great to know that, that yeah. this meter on this camera isn't just a, you know, an outdated artifact to go right. with it. Um, yeah. and, and, and then there's always the, the choice of getting a handheld. Oh, for sure, sure, which I think yeah. is, is the way to go. But it's, it's really nice, again, if you're trying to be inconspicuous and try to go along, you know. Um, but, Mark, what you were saying about just the aspect of digital kind of getting people to not really think about what they're doing and they just can go out and shoot so interesting how we don't think about the same thing happening at the turn of the 19th century mm -hmm. um, with the Kodak camera and the Brownie. And right. then you had all these people from like William Fox Talbot and all these, these, these masters of the craft who were incensed that now anybody could be a photographer. Right. So it's all just, it's interesting how it all kind of comes in these waves of just kind of making the art form more accessible to more people. Well, you know? to tell a quick story, I, I, I was in Africa working in with a nonprofit photographing for a couple of weeks and I came back and my, 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 my fam, my son and his wife and our two grandkids live up in Milwaukee. So I'm talking to my son, he puts my grandson on the phone who's eight years old at the time. And, you know, I'm asking him the typical grandfather stuff about school and everything and ask him. So, you know, ask him what he wanted to be when he got older and you know, he wanted to be like his dad who works on high end auto body, you know, and cars. And he says, Papa Mark, he says, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a photographer. And he says, well, what do photographers do? And I go, well, I just told you I was in Africa and I was photographing, blah, blah, blah. And I see you and your dad and your mom and your sister. And I, you know, I make photographs of you. So photographers make photographs. And you can hear him, you know, thinking over the phone line. And he says, oh, oh, well, then I guess everybody's a photographer. <laughs> but, I mean, but, 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 but that's the, I mean, that's his viewpoint of being sure. eight years old and yeah. growing up with, you know, phones and cameras and yep. everybody's a photographer, you know. Well, and, in some way, shape and form, everybody can be. It can be. Yeah. Exactly. And then, and then and, more accessible. Right. It should be. But that, just because there's more images being made doesn't mean there's more good images being sure. made. And that's always the, the key, you know, is yeah. um, there are tons more images being made. But are they really saying something in the, you know, in, in, in the fine art sense? Right. Commercial stuff is completely different. So getting back to the gear a little bit here, we also have another 6.6 six camera, the uh, Hasselblad, which which model? I know it's a 500 series, but it's a... 500 CM. 500 CM. So this is, honestly, this camera and probably even this, this Roliflex, or at least this style, are probably some of the most iconic cameras. They're head turners. Like ever made. Well, I mean, the, uh, yeah, this is, um, this is when you think of the astronauts walking on the moon yep. and photographing, they used this, well, a modified version of it, but sure. uh, it's, yeah. uh, 
this is, I mean, I still have one. I mean, I got, I mean, when, when I was in school, my, my two, you know, things I wanted were a Hasselblad and a Leica rangefinder. You know, that was it. And I still have them because they're still as good today as they were back then. So what is it about these cameras, like the Hasselblad or this, this Rolly Flex that make them so iconic? Has it just been the, the, the kind of the, the time that's passed and how many images no, they've taken? I, I, or is I, I think in, in terms of Hasselblad is that they made a system that was interchangeable over decades. So you could use lenses over a period of time. You could put backs on cameras over a period of time. You could put viewfinders on these cameras over a period of time. So when you, you bought into the system, you weren't going to, all, all of a sudden, you know, it, it become obsolete and you couldn't use new lenses or new backs that they came out with. Or, you know, so, I mean, I think that was a big thing about the Hasselblad for a working professional. And then the reality was the optics. I mean, it's whether it's, it's a Leica or it's a, a, a Hasselblad. I mean, European optics, European glass is different the Japanese glass. Sure. And you look at the Absolutely. contrast. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, I think that's, you know, I mean, to me, and then, I mean, for me, it's like, I still have my 500 CM because I wouldn't get rid of it, but I can buy a phase one back for it. Yep. Yeah. And I can use it as a digital, you know, uh, a six, four, five sensor in it. And I can, you know, put one on and now get something that's maybe 40 megapixels at a relatively low price and still make some great photographs. Very cool. Yeah, speaking of longevity, the systems, what, it was just last year or the year before that Hasselblad just discontinued this V-series. The V-series, yeah, yeah. right about that. And uh, even thinking about the RB Pro S here, not even just the RB67, but the Pro S model was made for 17 years. Like to wow. think about one particular model of a camera well, being made that long now. I mean, well, it, 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 go ahead. No, I was. Gonna, I mean, why change it if it works? I, that's basically yeah. what it boils down to, and I, and I think that's where the technology with it. We keep getting these little minor changes, and everybody has to rush out and buy it because it's going to make them a better photographer, and it's just not the case. It's, 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 it's it, it. My dad always said, you know, it's uh, the tools don't make the carpenter. And that's right. basically what it boils well, down to. Well, and then I think if you look and you say, look what happened from 2000 to now. I mean, we've, we've reached an apex. I mean, do we need that many more pixels? Do we need do we need a camera that has 100 focus points instead of 65? Do we have, need I a camera use the that... One. Right, I mean, I, I, use, use, that was gonna yeah, say. I, I use manual <laughs> focus, right? But I mean, I think we've reached that we're the, you know, point of diminishing return. And so I think that's, you know, when we look at something like the Hasselblad, that was, again, at a time when it, you know, in, into the 50s, late 50s and into the 60s, when a lot of this stuff sort of came to its peak in terms of technology. And, and then it just kept on going along. Yeah. So some of these camera systems, like I loved, I got my RB because it was relatively cheap, unlike the scale of medium format stuff. But they, and I think they've gone up in value a little bit since I bought mine. But um, some of these systems like the Hasselblad, these are still go for a really decent market value. Right. This uh, this particular outfit, which is the body, a back, and a basic lens with the with the waist level on it, is seven hundred seventy one dollars. No, that I mean that's cheap. Oh yeah. I mean think about it. I mean a, this, you know, a lens, the camera body, and the back for seven hundred fifty. I mean that's like, I mean when this was new, you couldn't get a lens for seven hundred fifty dollars. Right. right. And that was in, you know, 1970 or $80. So if you're looking to get into film photography and you want quality cameras, I mean, we have a whole array of them here and they're not really that expensive. Yeah. I talked to a guy recently and he, he was asking me specifically about this camera. It was really kind of a, a fun conversation. I, I was like, so what makes you decide you want to get a Hasselblad? He goes, well, it was the camera my dad had that wouldn't let me touch it. <laughs> he goes, and I can afford it now. Yeah, there you go. That's funny. It, it, and you were saying something about, um, Stephen, you were saying that it, why is it um, something that is timeless? I, you know, I recall seeing pictures of, you know, a, a historical moment taking place and you see there's a photographer in the background and they were holding either a Hasselblad 500 CM or uh, the 503 or whatever, uh, or a Rolleiflex, you know, those two, like, uh, you know, the, the, the pictures from the moon were shot with a Hasselblad. 
Um, you mean, know, it's, it's become kind of a cultural icon. There's a, they, they are Elvis Costello, this, uh, the album, this year's model. He's got like on the front cover is him with a house of live camera, taking a picture of himself. Amazing. That's great. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I think, I think there was one of you know, Natalie Merchant, either on her album or her video where she's got a, a Leica. Mm-hmm. Oh well, yeah, and you pointed out in movies there was like Kong Skull Island, like uh, Brie Larson, I think is the actress's name, like has like a like a um, she's got like an M three, she's walking around like photographing mm-hmm. like King Kong with. That's awesome. So, well, we're we're gonna switch up gears because there is one last camera on this table that we have not. Oh, uh, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> um, that. What the heck is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big camera. It's a. It's a really cool camera, and this is probably my favorite field of photography. It's something I've never been able to afford. This is the Fuji G617. It's a 6 by 17 um, negative, so it's a pretty massive negative. A 2 and a quarter by uh, 6 and 3 quarter. Right. Inches. So that's the actual negative itself is two and, and a quarter, quarter inches by six and three quarter inches. So you get, I'm looking at the camera right now. You have four shots on a, a four shots on a roll on a 120 roll. Of film. Oh Talking gosh. about making each shot count. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No kidding. Oh my gosh. And especially if like you accidentally bop the back. You destroyed. No, like you did. Yeah. Your film. yeah. <laughs> well, and, and you know, we, we have the Fuji here, 617, but. I had a Linhoff 617 and you know some both of them made versions of these cameras this one has a it, it's a fixed focus a fixed lens right. Linhoff had one with a fixed focus lens which is a 90 millimeter super angular but they also made versions that had interchangeable lenses on there and they had Linhoff actually had an inter, interchangeable viewfinder so you're but these cameras you weren't looking through the viewfinder and focusing you had to actually focus zone focus because there was no way there was no real coupled lens to the viewfinder to actually compose i mean it had etched lines in there and then you just sort of framed it but then use the zone focusing to to get your focus and because you're using a roll in here you can't like have ground glass or anything to look through right no that's brutal (laughs) so so for me actually when i decided to buy this well, I was doing a, a photo trip out in, in Arizona and I was alone and I was driving for 50, miles at a time, not seeing anything. And I started making photographs in my rear view mirror. Oh, very cool. Okay. So I was looking and composing as I'm driving and it's like, man, that would be nice to have that format. And that's exactly, I mean, if you look at your rear view mirror, that's almost the exact size of a two and a quarter by six and three quarter inch negative. And cool. so that's that's how I decided to, to, to buy, you know, and, and start using it. So these are a weird kind of, I don't know, I, it's technically Weird's a pretty good word. For yeah, it. pretty good. I mean, it's it's a very specific camera. It's not nearly as heavy. It's weighs less than the RB67 does right here. It's um, kind of deceiving too. Yeah. I mean, with it's got the the rail system. What is, what is that rail system for exactly? <laughs> That's more for protection, protection of the lens. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, but it's it's strange because it it's medium format because it uses 120 or 220 film, um, but it's really a large format camera, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Most definitely with a negative that size. And if you look over here, you see there's the bubble, the level mm-hmm. bubble up in front, um, because you have to get this thing level to get straight lines. But right. the, the, the Linhoff actually had the bubble system in the viewfinder, and it had both to, b- both oh, access. Cool. Oh, wow. You okay, know, cool. uh, and so you'd get it all lined up, so you had perfectly... Uh, parallel lines nice. in your in your image and this is a large format lens on here even right now it oh yeah. and, and the, the the one thing though and we talked about this before the recording started was that because the distance from the front of the lens to the film in the center was so much shorter than it was going out to the edges that these cameras required a, a two-stop neutral density center filter that you had to screw on so the 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 center of the film uh, was gonna would be exposed by two stops more than the edges because they were so far away. That's so, so you, crazy. So you had to put neutral density in the in the middle of your lens, and it and it feathered out to nothing in the edges, so that you get an even exposure across the six and three quarter length of the film. That that kind of just in camera, just even having to consider that is just so foreign to a lot of what we're used to shooting today. 
um, would you meter for, how would you meter your film? Would you rate like over for overexposing well, the edges? Or? No, no. I mean, you just, I mean, you, you take, you know, the filter factor, which was, you know, two stops and you filter that in, I mean, on your light meter, cause you were using a handheld light meter, right? Sure. So you just, you know, it's, instead of it being uh, a 400 speed, it would be a 100 speed. And that's, you'd set it to 100 and do your light meter reading and give it that exposure. And then it would be fine across the entire, because you're knocking down two stops of light going through the center. Okay, gotcha. Uh, so okay. you're rating it on what the center would be then? Yes. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, the center, I mean, the center now is... Is, is because is, of that, that filter that is going yeah. up. Right, yeah, the filter. Yeah, because yeah, I know uh, I know we're talking about medium format here, but in, in certain very wide, large format cameras, um, I want to say like 75 millimeter and wider, you, you have that same problem. And I've seen... Uh, I'm trying to remember, maybe in Clyde Butcher, I can't remember. He had a filter that you you look at it, it's darker in the center. Right, so it's it's, right. complete, it's, a, it's it, complete opposite. Right. He's, of a, he's using an 8x10 view camera. Yep. He's got maybe a 75 millimeter lens. But, you know, it, and it also is rated on the coverage of the lens. Right. I mean, right, your, your lens gives you a, a circular image. Right. Uh, you're trying to make a rectangle in the, in the middle of it, right? Right. As you said, sometimes where you your rectangle goes out to the edges isn't getting the same amount of light right right so you needed that i mean and then you know well we'll talk about large format later on but you know any tilt and shift on i mean any shift of the Mm -hmm. lens and you're starting to to lose yeah yeah but there's no tilt and shift on on this one these are straight on straight on yeah well again because you'd have no way of being able to see that Right. If you were tilting and shifting focus. So it has to be that very, I'm sure you probably want to shoot this thing. What it's no, yeah. F8 I, is as wide as it goes. So, I mean, and that's probably even a pretty shallow depth of field. On this oh, case. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would shoot, you know, what, is it, what does this go down to? 32 or 64? 45. 45. So, I mean, I would shoot more in the 32 range, right? right. I, I'd always, I was, I was using 400 speed film had to rate it down because of the, and then on a tripod and, you know, you, you started getting comfortable, but you still, it was kind of scary because you couldn't see exactly where it was in focus. So you have to actually use the scale on the front of the lens that said at, at, at F32, I mean, and if you look at a lens, you'll be able to, it gives you the range of, if you put, if you move it, it you can have it from, Four feet to infinity is going to be in sharp focus, and that's you know the hyperfocal distance. You put you put that into effect, and and in the beginning you you hoped it would work, but <laughs> at, you know, but the more you did it, 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 it did because. But it's hard when you it's hard when you've started when you you know you're so used to looking through a viewfinder and focusing on exactly what you want. It's so strange because I mean, and it's the camera is very hand holdable. But, but it's never, not at the same time. Right. And, and yeah. you know, my Linhoff, my wife would call it the fake camera because that, it looks like it looks like a clown camera in a sense. And when you look, <laughs> it does. And, and, and so we, we would joke about this. And one time we're going through security and I had it in a, its own Halliburton little case and I went through, you know, and they said, oh, you're going to need to open that up. And I opened it up and, and, and the TSA person looked and said, this looks like a fake camera. <laughs> and, we, and then I both started laughing and the person looked at us like we were crazy, but we, we, we kidded about it because it does. It doesn't look like any other camera that you can, that you, you've had. Interesting. So, um, and Bill, I might be stepping on a transition you were going to make mm-hmm. at some point here. So just noticing like the, the different formats and anybody, if you haven't ever shot medium format looking into this, um, a lot of the different things we've been talking about, like six, 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 seven, six by 17. Um, there's not one standard medium format right. type of camera. There are more commons and more standard ones for sure. But versus like 35 millimeter or used to a DSLR frame where it's that one particular, that, that image, that's the two to three proportion. That's the 35 millimeter film frame. On medium format, we probably should have even mentioned this to begin with, but the camera itself dictates the size of the negative that you have. They're all using the same type of film, that 120, that medium format film, but you can put the exact same type of film in the Hasselblad and get a square image that takes up less film space um, than it does on the 6x7 or or the 6x17 that's going to be a much larger image, and that does give you more... 
it gives you more dramatic depth of field. It gives you more um, resolution and clarity and quality, less grain because you're dealing with physically a larger surface space. Right. Yeah, exactly. A physically yeah. bigger format. Well, um, and, and just to throw in to, to qualify is that when we say six by six, we're talking about centimeters. Yes. Yeah. Not inches. Yeah. yeah. And it's just become the, the kind of the, uh, the go-to, uh, I guess, terminology for it, just because that's how the cameras are labeled now at this point. It's just become so commonplace for us. But two and a quarter is the, is also the... Well, six six yeah. centimeters is two and a quarter inches. So mm -hmm. yeah. that's where we get the two and a quarter square, six by six. Yep. And but I, I just noticed uh, there's no 645 I was on just the table. Say that. I was a little so, sad. I, sh I should go over and grab my eight. I was going to say, there. so probably the most common, <laughs> I want to say the most used format especially for people like myself who are in the professional realm of shooting now too weddings portraits is the 645 which is six centimeters by 4.5 centimeters it's one of the smallest medium format formats you get typically like bill was talking about his mamiya afd earlier you get 15 or 16 shots on a roll mm. depending on the type of camera right um, is there a reason you guys didn't include any six, four, five cameras or hey, you just grabbed whatever? Was on the no, show. I, I, <laughs> these are just cameras that I've, I've always just really loved. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, they're a little bit more unusual, not quite as common. I always see the six forty five as being a little bit more common, so yeah. it's pretty easy to find it, but these are just such iconic cameras. Well, sure. They are. Yeah. Hands I mean, down. The, and the six, four, five came out really as a, as a way for less, a, less, professional photographers to get into the two and a quarter market they uh, came in after all of okay. these as a way to do that and then i mean if you take something like the hasselblad the hasselblad has a six by four six forty five back for this camera same thing right. with the rb67 yeah, right. so yeah. you can you can get those um i mean i think some of these things even had inserts yep. like panorama right. inserts or things the like that for the mamiya six. seven six. and a six i believe uh, there yeah. is a insert that you can use with their 43 millimeter lens. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think with the six, you had a panoramic insert for right. it. And that we didn't mention the six, which is basically the Mimia 7's um, older brother mm -hmm. um, that is a square format. So 6.6. Six. Totally different lens mount, but very similar as far as the style of the body, the quietness, the lightness. And that's really just a preference of shooting if you like the Certainly. rectangular or the square format. And what I really love about all the different formats is that it changes composition yeah. as far as how you're shooting because dude um, i can't I, I suck at shooting square format i'm so <laughs> bad at it. well you would think with all the photos we post on instagram now that would be all pros at square format. yeah but i always <laughs> use the i was using like the uh, the apps before instagram let you post the whole image the ones that would like let you put white on the side of it like uh square up and things like that <laughs> just because i wanted to get my whole composition oh man no i love square format um i mean it was what i first started on and um, uh, that has a blood, you know, it just, and I keep staring at it, but I mean, it's, it's still the, the six, seven though. Yeah, I have you, not you're, shot six, seven yeah, you're yet. You're clutching the Mamiya seven in your hands as you're staring at the house. Of blood. It's my precious. <laughs> it will be once you shoot it. I shot that camera for yeah. like Brent mentioned, I, I rented that when I was, Oh geez, that was 2008. I want to say I rented it for a few weeks in a semester in school for one project I was working on and I was shooting my RB, but I wanted the same film format, but I wanted something lighter because I was doing some light trespassing. Um, and I rented it at a local store, had them for rent and it was, I didn't want to give it back. Um, I had, the, <laughs> I had the 45 millimeter lens with the couple viewfinder for it. And it was just, I, I didn't take a bad picture. I mean, you can't beat it. The, this for getting what you get with it. It's pretty amazing. It, the, the crazy thing about it, there's really only about four lenses available yeah. for it. So, yep. mm -hmm. which is selection tools. Yeah, I said, this is the 65 millimeter. Which, again, when you go into different formats, this is something we didn't talk about yet. You Good have point. Yeah. all of these different focal lengths of lenses are determined. What they actually show and you see is determined by the format of the camera, like where yep. the image is being recorded. Um, so like a 50 millimeter on a full frame DSLR or a 35 millimeter camera, 50 millimeters going up to say six by seven, a 50 millimeter is all of a sudden a pretty wide lens. Right. Your field of view is, is, is significantly larger. Yeah. Uh, you know, looking at this like 65 millimeter on a, on a six, seven, as opposed to, um, a 65 millimeter on say like a six forty five. um, the focal length, uh, I, 
think it's still the same if I remember correctly, but it's just the surface area is it's, is different, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's just slight differences. So like the standard lens on a 645, the equivalent to about like a 50 or whatever it would be, right. is a 75 millimeter lens. Right. And on 6.7, that's right. It's about yeah. an depending on the camera system, it's either like an 80 or a 90 millimeter. Right, right, right. So it's just a little bit more. But and I was going to ask you about that. Um, the so the standard I think lens that the and they probably sold it in all different kind of configurations. But the uh, on the Mia 7, it was an 80 millimeter lens that it came with. That's correct. But this one is now, and this particular one you were showing us is even engraved as uh, used to be like a manufacturer sample camera. Correct. They take around to stores, which is just cool history for starters. But so the lens, this is a 65 millimeter lens. Do you know anything about or like why this setup would have been more desirable than an 80 millimeter or just well, this, was it what they had to show at the time? Yeah, I think this, well, this actually had a, all the lenses with it that said sample on it. Oh, okay. So cool. it was, it was purchased as a, as a complete kit. Um, when we get something oh, okay. in like that, we tend to split it up and, and sell everything individually. So you can really kind of cater it to what you, what you want. Sure. Sure. So that just makes more sense for us. And it gives a lot more opportunity rather than having to buy a fixed kit. But this was just a nice wide angle lens that would have come with it. And very versatile, especially for street photography, something, you know, that you want to, you want to keep as small as possible with, with, with in this case, uh, as large of a negative as possible. So it just works out very well. Nice. That's good. And this one, because it is a range finder, it's not an SLR. You, um, and when you change your lens, it doesn't change the viewfinder. Um, this one will change the viewfinder. Oh. So when you put on a, the lens, it actually changes the parallax. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, that's another advancement. Some cameras like certain models of Leica's have different frame lines for different right. focal length yes, lenses. That's right. And that's something I forgot about this. Um, except there's one, like the, I want to say it's the 45 millimeter I shot on this has a separate viewfinder that actually mounts into the hot shoe. Correct, because the, the actual viewfinder can't compensate enough for it. Yeah, exactly. But you could still, so you'd look down and you'd focus, and then you'd go and compose your shot, or yes. vice versa. Yes. But that's, I had no idea, actually, that it adjusted the focus yeah. for it. That's really, really cool. It's something, it sounds pretty unique to the system. I don't know any other rangefinder that does that. It's pretty. It's a pretty unusual camera, <laughs> yeah. to be honest with you. And I want it. Yes. This is my, I was telling the guys, this is my, my bucket list. This, this would be my desert island camera. <laughs> I don't even own one now. Yeah. And I, I can't justify buying one at any point, but I want to buy one. It has such a great feel in your hand. I it mean, does. they just did a great job with ergonomics on it. Oh, they really, really did. That's such an awesome camera. Give it back. No. <laughs> just to let you guys know, the, all the cameras yeah. that I brought, I, I purposely brought just to kind of give it a, an idea as far as our grading. Everything that we have here is in our bargain grade. This is so. Are you serious? This yeah. Rolleiflex is in bargain. Yeah. What? What? This thing looks like it could have been stored in somebody's attic in like a pristine, like vacuum sealed bag for twenty years. Oh, oh, and it again. has the and the smell is free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we we have pretty high standards. That's um. That's insane. Wow. I don't, I shudder to think what you would rate my RB at. I'm sure it would be <laughs> ugly for sure because the leatherette's peeling off of mine and it's got scratch. There's not a scratch on this thing. I know. It's nice, isn't it? Oh, jeez. Even, so, even that Hasselblad? It, you really got to kind of look for it. Um, it's it's something that, you know, the longer you do it, you can kind of pick up the little sure. minor imperfections. Yeah. So it's it's not difficult to pick up one of these cameras and go, okay, there is, there's the issue, there's the issue, there's the issue. But, you know, we, we have to stick with these standards and... It helps us when we're selling. It doesn't help us when we're trying to buy because it makes it more difficult because we do have yeah. to be picky. So, you know, that's something that we, you know, when we're talking to somebody on the phone, trying to walk them through the, the selling process is tell me what you're seeing. You see any nicks, scrapes, scratches, anything that would right. stand out. You got to pull up the, you have to pull out the, no, no, dark oh, side. The dark side. No, on that side. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So, I mean, in what we're talking about, even though they're considered bargain, so I mean, optically, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the cameras. So, Correct. I mean, they're going to produce, you know, images just like they did when they were brand new. And just so you know how the grading scale works, once we determine the camera's working perfectly functional, everything's working on it, optically it's it's fine, no haze, fungus, anything like that. It's all based on aesthetics for us. Okay. Interesting. Sorry, I'm just kind of mesmerized by House of Blood. This still is like, I just, I know people who, like, it's, it's like a, like a, you know, you yeah. get it and you're hooked and you're like, it's the best system you've ever had, or there are people who just don't get it? Well, I think it's, I've had a lot of friends. I mean, I know we're going to be talking about 35 millimeter in the next 
uh, podcast. But yeah. m- one thing that happens with a lot of people back in the film days where everybody said, I have Leica, Leica M system. They always wanted one and then they got it. And within six months, they get rid of it because mm. they didn't give it enough time to right. to learn and and get get familiar with using a rangefinder system. There we go. I'm sitting here, even just tr- struggling, trying to pop up the uh, <laughs> the shade on the, the viewfinder. The yeah, exactly. Well, and, then, and, and if you want to, if you know this, but underneath your right hand, mm-hmm. there's a lever. See that black lever? The one right here. Yeah, push it up. So that Ooh. locks up the that locks up the mirror ah. on it, so that then you can shoot it and, and you don't get the mirror vibration. Yeah, yeah, which is definitely needed on these larger. Phones. I I, I, yeah. I would use this on a tripod. I had used mine on a tripod all the time, and I would never make a photograph without locking up the shutter first. Right, and I for, mean the mirror first, especially on like that that RB like. Uh, oh I've, yeah, I've used the mirror lock multiple times on it. Yeah, six seven mirror. <laughs> God, I love it. It's yeah. so good. Uh, it's the best sound in the world. The, the Hasselblad's kind of interesting. It, you know, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but it's amazing how long camera systems were out. So the 501 CM or 500 CM, I'm sorry, was out from 1970 to 1994. So the longevity on wow. these cameras compared That's to modern cameras, it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah. Well, I know people who are professional photographers that are not that old yet. Hmm. <laughs> But I mean, I think it yeah. sort of goes back to what I was just saying about reaching an apex in digital. Yeah. I mean, when you got to this point, there wasn't much more that you were going to do to make it better. You could you could add a prism on it that had auto exposure or something and blah, blah, blah. But the basic camera and the lens and the backs, what were you going to do to them to, to mm. actually make it better? Yeah. Well, and this is going to be an awesome segue, but you can actually get your hands on one of this, except for this might be a seven. This one's mine already. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but um, uh, Brent, uh, you have something special for the listeners here. What do you got? I do. Uh, this is going to be a coupon code that's good till the end of September. Uh, it's going to be good for 10% off of any of the medium format equipment that we've talked about or anything that we have in stock. So as long as it's medium format film gear, you'll get 10% off. And is that all everything, accessories, lenses? That is going to be just bodies and lenses. Okay. Um, The coupon code is AUG-C41-MF. So basically anything that's going to be manual focus, body, lens is covered. Okay, cool. Well, that's really awesome that you guys are doing that because, I mean, for for even 10% on like even like the RB, you know, that's huge. And, um, it's, you know, even though it's like a, it's a, a professional body, I mean, that at the price point that it's at, you know, getting into medium format is absolutely possible. Um, you know, back in the film days, I mean, it, it was 35 millimeter was kind of like the consumer format and then medium format were the commercial guys. And then you had the large format that were, I guess, were the fine art, I guess. Would, would uh, you guys and, say that's right? Or? And, and some, you know, commercial photographers. I mean, okay, you were yeah. doing commercial photography in the studio. I mean, you know, we talk about layers in Photoshop and masking. I mean, they were doing right. in-camera masking and layers on, on you know, 4x5, 5x7, 8x10 ectochrome film. Yeah. I mean, you didn't have the luxury of of taking something into a computer. You had to do everything in-camera. Well, way. especially if you're shooting like transparencies, you got to get it right, 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 right then and there. Yeah. So, I mean, this is absolutely awesome. That's really cool. You guys to, uh, to offer a little discount, uh, to just give that person that extra little push to go ahead and, and jump into medium format. It, it, at first it is a little scary because it's not, you're not used to it, but it's very important that I think that you should try formats that you've never shot before because you learn. And, uh, I mean, six by six was the first, my, my intro into uh, medium format. And, uh, um, and then I was absolutely, uh, intimidated by my AFD. I, I mean, just, I, the back and everything. And, you know, I felt like I was going to break the thing at first, you know, cause I, I just got in, I didn't know what to do with it, you know? Um, but you know, to, to now look, look at all these cameras and everything, I feel much more confident that within you know a few minutes I'll be able to figure out how to certainly 
yeah. shoot this Mamiya Seven or even like the Rolly Flex for sure. Yeah, like so. I could pretty much load any film back at this exactly. point on one of these. You know, after doing it to a few different formats, and it, and it forces you to look at the world in a different Absolutely. way. Absolutely, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Amen to that. Whether it's a just the fewer frames, the heavier camera, looking through a waist level Slowing finder, you down yeah. to to yes, yeah. So, but wait, there's more. Yeah, well, I would wanted to add one other thing. If there's something that you're looking for on the website and yeah. you can't find it, um, and you really want it, give us a call. Um, we have an 800 number you can call. It's 800-342-5534. Talk to one of the sales guys we have. They'll walk you through the process. If there's something that you're looking for, they can kind of keep notes on it uh, and, and contact you when it comes into stock because they do when they have downtime oh, go through their cool. notes. So if you're looking for something specific and you don't see it on the site, call us because we want to help That's out. That's great. That's cool. And then on something else we wanted to add in, uh, Photo Plus Expo is like the biggest photo industry show each year. And there's basically three big shows. This is the biggest of the three. And we've got free passes. Excuse me. Free passes if you would like to attend the show, if you're going to be in New York, um, anywhere between October 26th, 27th, and 28th. So um, we'll have that in the notes on this. So um, we, make, we can make sure that you guys get a pass if you want to. That's fantastic. It'll be on this awesome. on your on your website, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we so we're in the process. We we do have a domain now, <laughs> so it's uh, studio c forty one dot net. Unfortunately, somebody got dot com way before us. So uh, unfortunately, I guess I'm not that as creative as I thought. So, but <laughs> uh, um, but yes, the, there is a website. I'm uh, trying to get around to developing it. But um, the promo codes um, will be in the show notes um, in the description. Uh, for iTunes and Google Play listeners. And then for those that are in uh, listening to this in YouTube, uh, we'll also include uh, those uh, promo codes um, in, there. So highlight, copy them, use them. Um, uh, go ahead and one more last one last time, let's go ahead and just give those um, codes again so everybody that didn't have a chance to write it down. Certainly. So the promo code for 10% off is going to be AUG dash C four one dash MF. So that's AUG dash C four one dash MF. And then the photo plus one, that'll just be a link in the show notes. That is correct. Okay. Okay. okay gotcha. A little too long and complicated to get Sure. <laughs> no worries. HTTP. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, geocities.com. Oh, slash. geez. <laughs> geocities. So, all right. Well, um, I think that is uh, pretty much it. I'm going to sneak out of the studio with this Mamiya 7. Uh, mm. Sorry, Brent. <laughs> Hold on. Let me help you with that. <laughs> no, but uh, honestly, thank you guys for coming yeah, out. Seriously. This, this was an absolute I know this one blast. ran a little bit long because we were talking about just a lot of uh, introductions and KDH yeah. and... I know uh, we've got in, in a couple of weeks again for our next show. What yes. Do we have coming up. Uh, in, the, in the next uh, episode, which is, will probably be about two weeks. Uh, I don't have the next date right in front of me, but uh, in about two weeks, we are going to be talking about large format. Um, so this one is going to be, I, I would say, a very technical conversation because um, there are a lot of different large format cameras, different formats that are even bigger. I mean, you have four by five, five by seven, eight by 10, 11 by 14. They just get, you know, huge. Um, but not only that, but the bellows, you have view cameras, you know, the, uh, the, the type of movements, uh, you get into different things called, um, the front standard, the rear standard. I mean, there's a whole different anatomy to these cameras that are nothing like, uh, even the medium formats or the lar uh, or the 35 millimeters. Right. Um, so it, it's going to be a very technical talk, but I mean, uh, go ahead, start looking into it. There's some great resources out there. Um, you know, heck, even just watch uh, some of the interviews of Ansel Adams before he passed away. Just, I mean, he dives more into talking about, you know, the essence of photography, but to see him, you know, using a large format camera kind of gives you a really good idea as far as, that anatomy of that equipment. And I have a great book that I got because I've just started shooting large format this year. Um, so there was a lot of technical stuff, but I think that was really cool for me because uh, I, I am a very technical person, but I also have that creative outlet. And so uh, I felt like large format made a lot of sense to me once I've sat down and actually read the book, but I'll bring the book in and we'll, we'll get in. Well, that. there, the, the sort of the three books that were the Bible. Oh, yeah. 
were Ansel Adams, the camera, yep. the negative, and the print. Yep, yep. And so, and you, those, that information still holds true. You just, you know, it can switch digital terms into chemical photographic terms, yep. and it's the same thing. So that that's everybody that's listening. That's your homework assignment. Uh, Get those books. You can get them really cheap on Amazon. Uh, you know, get a beat up, get a beat up book. You know, it's the 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 information that comes out of it is just absolutely astounding. So, well, uh, Brent, Mark, thank you guys again for coming out. Can't wait to have you guys out for the large format one in a couple weeks. And uh, that is uh, pretty much it. So, thank you guys, and we'll see you on the next episode.